let's go across uh, across the Atlantic Ocean. Rich Eisen joining us right now from London. Yes. Rich, it's good yes. to see you there. Rich, how, uh, are you? How, how are we doing? Did you sleep? Are we still in the deprivation chamber? No, Where are we at? I got my rest. I got my rest. Oh, good. Um, and uh, I'm feeling good about myself. Feeling all good. Uh, met with the Vikings today. Uh -huh. I've got some good stories from that. Woke up this morning, uh, saw that uh, Kirk Cousins had his own London game. See what I did right there? Oh, I know. Um, well, Drake London game. You know what I mean? See what I'm saying? No, we got it. Uh, <laughs> so I got to tell you, it, it really is a testament to the fans of the NFL who are locals here in London that the marquee games, the, the night games, uh, kick off anywhere between one or two in the morning, depending right. on right. what right. time of the year it is, whether the clocks are going to be sprung forward or not. And because, uh, again, I mean, I was so done uh, last night around nine o'clock, which is uh, four o'clock Eastern and woke up this morning and and caught up on everything that the uh, the Falcons and the Bucks did last night. And so it is, again, a testament to NFL fans here, how dedicated you have to be to Monday night football, Sunday night football, Thursday, even think about watching those games live. And uh, my essential takeaway is uh, the, the fact that the Falcons have, through five weeks, positioned themselves to win the division, uh, despite starting in the manner in which they did, um, you know, going to one and two, uh, losing to the Chiefs and having won their last two in a row against the opponents that they're going to have to beat and hold serve with at home and um and that's what they you have to do you gotta you gotta you gotta hold serve at home now fascinatingly enough they needed some plus 50 50 plus yard kicks from uh from young way coup in order to win one uh with no time left against the saints in week four and then force overtime in week five in a game in which the buccaneers uh made uh numerous mistakes and also Unfortunately for the Bucks, did not have a, an offsetting penalty situation on a clear, a clear uh, face mask penalty that mm -hmm. would have kept them in field goal range at the end of the game, rather than having to punt back to Atlanta, which used that opportunity to tie the game and then win the coin toss and win in overtime without Baker Mayfield touching the ball again. But that's not a. I didn't see those photo that photograph on the standings that we just put up on the screen. So. Falcons hold serve, and if they want to win the division, they're going to have to win one of those games, I would think, on the road. They do sit back now and watch the Bucks and Saints play each other and maybe, you know, one of them knock the other one off. And uh, that'll be, you know, next up for for the Bucks. The Saints obviously have a big game against the Chiefs at home. Uh, uh, I mean, on Monday Night Football in Kansas City. So Atlanta gets to sit back uh, there in first, thanks to the tie break over the Bucks. Um, you you, you got to think that maybe the, the Saints are uh, in trouble in Kansas City, but you never know. So uh, the Falcons through five weeks, that's the team that um, I picked to win the division. And then uh, Brockman and I famously jumped off of in, I believe, was that the week one or week two version of Overreaction Monday, mm, Christopher, where two, we both I think? mea culpa yeah. that thing, right? Yep, yep. yep. Um, I may have to mea culpa my mea culpa. What do we call that? Uh, like maya a, maya triplo i don't know what that is workshop that i don't know what it is either but 500 <laughs> yards for for kirk you you know the you like that um business he, he's feeling it and um and the falcons get get it done it, it didn't it was teetering on the edge of them being you know one and four instead they're three and two and they're their best position to win this division right now that's my my exact thought which is nothing has been easy rich for the falcons this season even their three wins it's come down to needing a final drive in the philly game they needed a dropped third down pass last night you needed a missed call you needed some bounces to go your way they executed the setup for the field goal to force overtime in exactly the 11 seconds that they had to do it in but at the same time you see the progress when you watch that falcons offense because it did not look like this in week one it, it was it was a bad looking offense in week one which probably shouldn't have surprised anybody when you got a 36 year old quarterback coming off a torn achilles and a first time play caller last night was the first time 
even though there's a lot of Bijan Robinson owners, maybe one sitting at this desk, who are going, how does he not do more? How are you not getting the ball in his hands? But they're utilizing all the weapons, and that looked like a good offense last night against, by the way, a Todd Bowles defense, which is usually pretty hard to go against. Well, and, and and in terms of players making the most of their opportunities, obviously the game winner speaks for itself and who is the one who came up with it. But, um, you know, uh, Darnell Mooney has turned himself into a grade A National Football League weapon or uh, needing to leave Chicago to to find that spot in Atlanta. Um, he's, he's terrific. And um, he's fast. He's quick. He gets open. He makes plays. He gets yards after catch. And uh, obviously, if he and London can combine for that and Kirk Cousins doing what he did last night, uh, the Falcons, again, the question is, is how repetitive can it be? How repeatable is it? And um, not since uh, Terrell Owens uh, came up with 20 catches, thanks to Steve Mariucci on Jerry Rice Day, (laughs) have we seen anything colder than uh, Cousins breaking Matt Ryan's single game record uh, of passing yards on Matt Ryan night uh, in Atlanta. But I don't think Matt uh, really cares. Uh, everything's good in his hood right now. And and for the team to have a memorable night on his memorable night, I think that's pretty cool. I also saw Todd Bowles say this morning, he was asked a question about, would you, would you be in favor of face mask penalties or lack thereof being reviewable? Bowles is a recent addition to the competition committee. He said he's in favor. Mm-hmm. I have a significant issue with anything when we get into that realm. Face masks, you can no. say are more clear than certain other calls, but it's still a, it has to be a turn and a grab. What does that look like in slow-mo versus in real time? I am still of the mind, Rich, that if we dance down that path again, like we did five years ago with the pass interference thing, the result will be the same. It will not fix anything. It will bog down games and slow things down and cause a bigger oh, issue than simply leaving things the way that they have been on penalties for a long time. Pass interference is much more in, open to interpretation as to whether somebody grabbed a face mask and yanked with it. You could see it. The competition committee just doesn't want to leave it up to the replay assist to put a flag on the field. Right. Had there been a flag thrown on the field, uh, you know, and, and you could say there was a flag thrown on the play. It was just called on the Bucks. So once there's a flag on the play, it might open things up for anything that's possibly reviewable to be reviewed in the same way that replay has that um, mechanism uh, whenever there is a red challenge flag thrown. The competition committee just doesn't want to set things up for replay assist to put a flag on the field. Correct. When there is a flag on the field for a 15-yard penalty, I think every single one of those should be checked, QC'd by replay assist. The problem is, though, is that fans get confused. Even I get confused. I will uh, email Walt Anderson frequently during (laughs) these games to ask these questions that I think fans are wondering is why can't replay assist when something is so obvious like a missed penalty, why can't they chime in there? And I just gave you the answer. They don't want replay assist to chime in when there is no flag already on the field. But then there's the question of why is replay assist not chiming in when there's no flag on the field and something is clear and obvious, but it does chime in on Monday night in Miami when there is a backward pass thrown that is called incomplete. And then oh, replay assist says that was a backward pass. That's a turnover. So replay assist installed a turnover on the field in Miami for Tennessee because it was clear and obvious that the ball was thrown backwards and there was a clear recovery. Tennessee received a football on Monday night through replay assist. Why shouldn't replay assist then chime in when something is clear and obvious, even without a flag on the field? This is something that is, you know, going to have to, I think, be thrown in front of the competition committee again and should be brought to brought to bear any time that there is something that's 15 yards on the field that's already been called it should be reviewed by replay assist the question is the thorny issue is when a flag hasn't been thrown do you want one placed by a nameless faceless entity that's looking from high on high i understand why the league doesn't want to open that pandora's box then why when something is ruled incomplete you say that's not an incompletion that's actually a turnover why is that fine? Why can you install a turnover when one hasn't been ruled on the field, but you cannot 
install a 15 yard penalty because one hasn't been ruled on the field. I kind of don't see the difference. I would kind of think a 15 yard penalty being called when one hasn't already been installed on the field is less of a biggie than a turnover that we saw on Monday night. That's something for the competition committee to answer. Well, the baseline for the competition committee, as I've understood, has always been they don't want to substitute one person's judgment for another's. It's and not a judgment. It was it was a judgment whether whether it was a backwards pass or not. Correct. It was just so a they're poor, saying poor that's objective the versus subjective. The issue is the way all these penalty rules are written, they are inherently subjective. Even the face mask, which we can all look at it and say yeah, that's a clear face and mask and all that business. But it's sure. then it's okay if he. I mean, listen, you're right in the one. There was a play last week where the face mask literally appears to have been called on the wrong guy. Right, where a penalty right. gets put one way and it was the other guy who actually grabbed the face mask. Giants, those are the Cowboys, ones correct. Those are the ones that become really difficult here. I just I know what a disaster the pass interference thing was. I know I mean you recall it was haphazardly put in because a bunch of coaches at the owners meeting said like, Hey, we should do this. They hadn't really had all the vetting process like they normally do. They said, All right, we approve it. Now let's write the rule. And the rule obviously was not enforced for a, a long period of time. Uh, let me ask you this too, Rich, before we break. You said you spent time with the Vikings. Yes. You got to see your old friend Sam Darnold. Tell me about. Uh, tell me what you learned from the Vikings. Well, here's what I learned. I want to tell this story here because I think it's indicative of a lot. And um, I, I will say just as the headline that the Vikings are for real. This isn't a fluke. This is actually the product of a terrific coaching staff in place of a terrific front office that has placed very high IQ players in the hands of a very high IQ coach who can have a very intricate system. And it's on both sides of the ball as well, I might add. Very intricate systems that they are very good at simplifying for their players with multiple options based on looks that they see in front of them. And that because it's simplified in such a way, it allows these players to play faster and freer. That's the headline. I got that out of meeting with Kevin O'Connell today and uh, Sam Darnold, um, John Grenard, and we also met with Justin Jefferson. And my favorite story that kind of illustrates all of this is I asked Kevin O'Connell for his favorite Justin Jefferson story. And he said that when he was introduced as the new HC of Minnesota a few years ago, coming from the staff of the Rams after they had just won the Super Bowl, he finishes his introductory press conference. He steps off the podium and he steps into a hallway where he's greeted by a member of the Vikings staff holding a phone. And on it is somebody who FaceTimed in and it was Justin Jefferson. He said Justin Jefferson's first question of him when he became new head coach was why is Cooper cup wide open so often? That's what he asked him. And he goes, well, the reason why is because he plays the Z he plays the X he plays the Y we put him all over the field. And so he knows every route from every position in our playbook. And so we're able to scheme him in that manner to which Kevin O'Connell said, Justin Jefferson replied, that sounds hard. And he, the coach said, yeah, it is. You're going to have to learn every single position on the field. And he was saying this to somebody who was Justin Jefferson later on when I asked him his point of view from the story, pointed out coming from the Mike Zimmer defensive-minded head coach that it was run first, pass second, and they were running from, you know, one would say offensive sets that were based around that concept. So he really only played the Z receiver, the outside receiver. He wasn't moved around a lot, which is maybe why he said that sounds hard and why Kevin O'Connell said, yeah, it's going to be tough. You know, do you want to do it? And his answer was yes. And you know who Justin Jefferson is right now is a guy who knows every single position on the field and the playbook from it. And because of that, every single time Jefferson is placed in something other than his, I guess, typical position outside, the slot receiver somewhere else on the field. Whoever he's replacing now goes to where he was, and that player now needs to know the formation and needs to know the route from that position. So Jefferson asking about, I want to be as great as Cooper Cup, 
He had 1,900 yards. He had a triple crown season. He's always open. Why is that? Because he accepted that challenge. Now everybody else in the receiver room has to accept that challenge. And everybody does what Jefferson is doing in the playbook. And O'Connell calls the game from that manner, but also simplifies it enough for everybody to kind of understand and take it all in and change the plays up significantly from week to week, depending on the opponent. And Sam Darnold has come in and is fit in hand and glove in this situation as somebody who, as he did say to us at the end of his tenure in Carolina with Ben McAdoo, as well as what he learned in San Francisco, he was able to slow the game down, observe it, and basically say, I'm more about the process now instead of the result. He was kind of done being the third overall pick that was now a journeyman. He was just focusing on the process, not about the results of his career. That's what I learned is you've got a defensive coach who's doing the same thing as O'Connell by having an intricate system able to boil it down well enough for players who are high Q enough, high IQ enough to go out and execute it. That's why this team is 4-0, not just because of some magic that's happening. It really is part of a plan, and it's awesome to watch in person. Big challenge for that Jets defense on Sunday going up against one of the hottest uh, hottest offenses, hottest teams. Cannot wait. Be on the pregame Adios. show bright and early, Rich. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. Still on Roku, Rich. Jets. Still here. Jets wait, fight. Wait, he I, was... I have a question if you want to take Rich's shot back. Do you have a fireplace in your hotel room? I was about to ask. Oh, that's yeah. fake. That's fake. That's fake. <laughs> Are you sure? Uh, yeah, it is. It's it's a mirror, Chris. That's a mirror. You can see that's a mirror. Oh, yeah. There. Uh, yeah the but it kind of looks. A Thanks for asking, on the though. Floor? Mirror on the floor? Mirror on the floor. Oh, you know what? The <laughs> camera's fake... in the way. Can I can't see. I mean, look, we know you're fancy enough to have a, a fireplace in your hotel. I thought you had a fireplace you know I mean? in Come there. on, dog. No, no I don't. But it, okay. by the way, it, I'm just happy that um, it's not me, that there's uh, movement uh, and forklifts behind oh, Tom. Oh, the, you, the last you know, three days have been crazy. Have no idea. What's happening? <laughs> no, no idea. I think there appear to be uh, building cubicles for something to move in the yeah. upstairs. And it's right. It's literally again. There, there there's many. Mul- there's multiple <laughs> entryways. <laughs> that that Tom. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot happening outside. I mean, there's yeah, li- Tom, can you get information there? Can you? Can you break that? Yeah, Tom, break can some news. Break, Go out there. And, uh, get they are some moving scoops. several objects that I've never seen in my life. That's what I would tell you, Rich. We got a lot of okay. parts. We get some long. Oh, the programmers it, first coming. Sound up? like metal boards. I'm not it's sure. Programmers. Not sure. Programmers. That's what they need to get around. Yeah, because absolutely, programmers need forklifts too. <laughs> I got it. Well, and these forklifts enjoy, have gents. Have a great on? weekend. Right. Catch the Rich Eisen show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern, for free.